Hello. I did promise that next time I'd be working with silk, I will be making a bodice out of this. This is silk that my grandmother bought in Korea in 1975. My grandfather had a job in the 70s working in Korea. I said that I wanted to be mindful and acknowledging of where these kinds of fabrics were, would come from. So I'm going to insert a portion here about the history of silk and, and how silk would have been used in the 1890s and where it would have come from. In the 19th century, silk was, uh, you know, I've, I've talked about this before, there's this idea that they were wearing silks all the time. That's not true. Silk was definitely more of a luxury fabric, um, just as it is today. You know, the wealthy people could afford to wear silk more often, and then, you know, the poor people would not wear it as often, but it was, it was definitely more of a luxury fabric. There were silks from all over the world. There are some very famous British, the Spitalfield, um, Spitalfield silk uh, weavers in Britain. There were very famous French silk weavers. I'm sure there were um, weavers in America and in all the rest of Europe too. But the kind of best quality silk that you could get would have been from China or Japan. Now, I'm not sure if these European silk weavers were actually raising silk or like if there were like actual silkworms being raised in Spitalfield um, or if they were buying in like raw silk from Asia and then just weaving it in Europe. I've not been able to find a conclusive answer about that. I'm sure there is a, con a conclusive answer out there. I haven't done a huge amount of research about this. Like I've, I've, I've done some research, but I, I, it's not like a master's thesis or anything that I've done. So I'm sure there is information out there and I'm just not able to find it. They, there was definitely though a lot of trade happening between uh, Asia and the West in the 1800s. This is something that I think we kind of give ourselves credit for kind of inventing this kind of like global, global, globalized trade in the 20th century. That's definitely not true. I mean, there's, there's been trade between Europe and Asia for since the Middle Ages, since before the Middle Ages. Really, there I feel like there has not really been a time when there has not been communication and trading between Europe and Asia, but it really, really took off in the Victorian era because they had all of these technological advancements, you know, steamships and trains and what have you and what have you. They were able to really get a trading, an industrial trading machine going. I cannot speak to specifically how silk trading would have, like, like how they would have treated their trading partners in the silk trade. However, based on experience of how Westerners tended to treat their Asian and African and South American trading partners in the 1800s and the 1900s and today, it was probably not, they probably didn't treat them incredibly well, just as oftentimes today, companies don't treat their trading partners in Asia and in Africa and in South America very well, or they don't treat their workers very well. You know, there's famously the Opium Wars. Britain tried to get China hooked on opium so they could <laughs> make it easier to make make it easier to uh, make trade deals. I'm s assuming I haven't been able to find anything specifically about silk, but based on how trading seems to have been done back then, it probably was. They probably weren't thinking, okay, how can I do this so that the uh, Chinese silk weavers can have, can, you know, can make a profit and have a good life. That probably wasn't top of their priority list. Again, I hasten to add, this is not like, oh, the cruel Victorians. I mean, look at how people, look at how factory workers in China are treated today, and you'll see that we've not gotten any kinder. So it's likely that silk was not incredibly ethical back then. I would, however, argue that silk production and silk, um, the silk trade back then was more ethical than the current um, fast fashion trade is. I feel as though the fast fashion trade is, is definitely more exploitative and certainly more environmentally uh, damaging than the silk trade probably was, although I can't say for certain. I have no way of knowing if the, the specific silk that I used is ethically produced. I lean towards yes, since it was bought in the country that it was it was presumably woven in Korea. I mean, I suppose it could have been woven in China and then shipped to Korea and purchased there, but I'm, I'm, I'm assuming it was woven in Korea. 
and I, you know, I feel as though the closer to the source something is, the more likely it is to be ethical, because it just doesn't go through so many steps of obfuscation, and when you're working more directly with the people who've made something, it's a lot harder to, to treat them terribly. I also can't really see my grandmother, you know, buying something from somebody she, like, she knew had been treated terribly. Now, she could have, you know, just not known <laughs> that people have been treated. But, like, I can't really see very many people, you know, like, buying something from, you know, supporting, like, like actively supporting an industry that they know is terrible. But there is, like I said, so much obfuscation. Um, a lot of people do inadvertently support these terrible industries. So it's very possible that this silk was made in, an, in a not very humane way, but I kind of, I lean towards it being more on the more humane side. Also, the oriental uh, pattern that's woven into, it's, it's, it's a damask silk. I learned that from one of the costume videos, the different types of silk weaves. I'd known about satin and taffeta and that's about it. But apparently damask is a satin kind of backing with designs woven into it, which is exactly what this is. So it's a, this damask weave with these oriental designs woven into it. I'm assuming they're Korean designs, again, since my grandmother bought the silk in Korea, but again, I'm not, I'm not a huge expert in Asian art, so, or in Asian geometric design, so again, they could be Chinese designs and were then shipped to Korea. I don't know. But having these sort of uh, oriental designs is very historically accurate. Now, the specific designs that are woven into this silk, I can't make any historical claims as to those, but having oriental designs woven into your silk or painted onto your pottery or whatever would have been incredibly popular in the late 19th century. There was this craze, it was called Japanism or Japonisme, which focused specifically on Japan, but kind of all of kind of East Asia, where all of that stuff became very, very popular, very, very popular. So you see just all kinds of Japanese-esque things. You get um, a giant craze for bamboo furniture in the 1880s through 1920. Um, you get a lot of stuff being lacquered. You get oriental vases. You get oriental carpets. You get willow pattern china. You get all of this stuff with an oriental um, Chinese, what they consider to be Chinese or Japanese styles. So I'm not going to go, I, I'm not going to like dive into the whole history of Japanism. I could, I could make a whole video on that alone. Um, it's sort of like, I've always thought of this Japanism as being kind of like, these people were the, the weeaboos of the 1800s. Did I use that word right? Weeaboo? Did I say something incredibly obscene? I don't know. I'm, I'm obviously not really part of that crowd, so <laughs> fingers crossed I use that term right. So that is a very, very brief, very, very roughshod history of kind of Victorian use of silk and how they would have gotten it. I think that's everything I wanted to say. So let's carry on with the video. So I'm going to be making this bodice from Truly Victorian, and I'm going to be using, I'm gonna be making this pattern here, the unadorned one. The moth went together really, really easily. I had to do practically nothing to the back, and then I just took in the darts in the front a lot, and I also took in the under sleeve seams, like the side seams, and then I lengthened the sleeves. I had a little bit of trouble with the collar, but that wasn't, that bad. And then just before I traced all of the uh, mock-up, all of the changed seams out and cut it all out, I tried it on one more time and then it was a little bit loose in the back so I kept on taking it in in the back a little bit more, a little bit more. And whenever I took it in in the back, it would get tighter in the front, but it was still just a little bit loose in the back until I'd taken it in a lot in the back and I could barely close it anymore. So then I had to let out the, um, the front darts <laughs> that I'd taken in. So I still never solved the problem. So I'm hoping that when I put a waste tape in, it will solve the problem. Also, it's very wrinkled, but I'm hoping that putting in boning will solve that problem. I'm gonna start tracing up the pattern onto the lining fabric. It's supposed to have a lining and an interlining. So for both of those, I'm just gonna use a white cotton. Um, so this, I'm, I'm very happy. This is, it's coming off as being quite blue, but it's actually a, like a teal turquoise color. So I'm very excited. This is my first time working with silk. Yeah, so I'm gonna start working on getting that pattern pinned down. I have cut out the linings and the interlinings, the whole thing, and I've 
read, or I've not thread marked it, I've marked all of the seams in heat sensitive pen that will disappear. And then I've basted them all together, just on the sewing machine. So now it is time for me to cut out the silk. And I'm very, very nervous and very anxious about it because that's the first time I've ever worked with silk. And I've heard rumors that heat disappearing, like markers or pens that disappear in heat don't work very well on silk. So I'm gonna do a bit of a test. I don't know what I'm gonna do if it turns out that the mark doesn't disappear. I don't know what I'm gonna use to mark the pattern out, but I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. But yeah, wish me luck, I'm gonna cut out the silk. I have cut out the silk and basted it all to the lining and the interlining pieces. It's coming out looking very blue on camera, but in reality it's this lovely kind of teal color. I'm hoping that'll kind of show up later when I'm filming outside in natural light. I'm very, very happy. I put in the darts already in the front. It's very, very thick. It feels, it's like armor, it's quite heavy. But I'm very pleased, it was so much fun to work with. So now I'm going to sew together all of the pieces with half inch seam allowances. And, oh, please let it fit me, please let it fit me. The mock-up fit me, but I'm still worried <laughs> because the fabric is expensive. That's not blood on that paper towel, that is ink. All right, I will get back to you when I've sewn up the pieces. So I think it looks very good so far. Try to zoom out a little bit, I can't. But there is a problem. I have no idea how this happened, but it is a good inch and a half too small. You can see here. It's a good inch and a half too small around the bust. I do not know how that happened. The mock-up fit me absolutely wonderfully. It fit me just fine. But somehow, in the translation from mock-up to silk, it got too small right here. But fortunately, this should not be an issue because I've got half inch seam allowances all the way through so I can just let out whoops I can let out this seam a little bit right here and potentially this one a little bit here and then the same on the other side and that ought to solve the problem luckily this silk is really forgiving um, so it shouldn't really make it shouldn't really show if I have to unpick something so, and then if worst comes to absolute worst, if it becomes absolutely necessary, I do have enough fabric left to um, recut the front pieces if I absolutely need to. I really want to avoid that, but if I can't find a way around it, then I do have the option to do that. So I'm going to let out the side seams a little bit and hope that that is enough to fix the problem. I will check back with you when I've done that. I've made the necessary alterations and it now fits like a glove. I have no idea how this happened. I'm going to put an extra inch on either side of this pattern piece. So next time I want to make this bodice, I won't have this problem. The problem is though, this has left me with practically no seam allowance to speak of. So I'm worried about how this is going to hold up over time. I do have, or I will have enough fabric left over, I think, after this bodice is done to recut this piece if I need to. I really don't want to do that, but if I, if that does become necessary, I will be able to. But right now, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to do is just overlock these tiny little seam allowances again, just to kind of keep them from fraying, and then I'm going to cover them up with twill tape. I'm just going to sew some twill tape on here, so that'll hopefully just keep it from fraying as much as possible. And I'm hoping, fingers, fingers crossed, hoping that that will work. But yeah, I have no idea how, how this happened. I, I'm scratching my head. I cannot figure out how on earth this came to be because my mock-up fit me so perfectly. But uh, who knows? I'm thinking maybe I, when I was fitting my mock-up, I like pinched it in on one side, but not on the other. So then one side was really small and the other side was still normal. So then I got the really small, I have no idea. But the problem has been solved and I'm going to uh, work on strengthening these tiny little seam allowances now. 
I'll check back when I'm actually back to work. Oh, I also took time to sew on some of the hooks and eyes. Not all of them. I've sewn on 18 now. The hooks are here, the eyes on the other side. Um, when I'm done, there will be 40. <laughs> 40 hooks and eyes going up and down just the front, and then the collar is going to deal with more hooks and eyes. So that's just tons of fun. Don't you just love hooks and eyes? So I'm going to work on reinforcing those seams, and then I'll get back to you. I think the next thing I'm going to do is going to be the collar because this part here didn't get overlocked. The silk is going to start to fray a little bit, so I'm going to put the collar on here to close that in, and then next it calls for a piped hem. I didn't really read the instructions. That was kind of exciting, actually. I didn't read the. I found myself just kind of getting into working without reading the instructions because I know enough about sewing now that I didn't really need them. She says as she <laughs> made a huge mistake, but I don't know how to do a piped hem. I know how to do piping in a seam, but I don't know how to do it around the hem. So I'm going to need to look at the instructions for that. But it calls for a piped hem, so I'm going to put that on because the same thing is happening here. This is a little bit of fraying. So yes, that's what I'm going to do. Can I just say, I really do not like making bias binding. Look how much of my fabric that is eating up. I was being so economical with cutting this, and just like this, I'm just wasting so much of it. <sighs> this is going this is going to be physically painful for me to cut this. So the collar is now on, as is the piping. Was, I had quite a time figuring out how to finish off the piping, but I think I got it right. I think it looks quite nice. I'm quite pleased with it. And the collar is just a plain white, but that's uh, intentional. That's gonna be covered up later, so that's okay. The back is so <laughs> stiff. It feels like it's boned, but it's not yet. But that brings me to what I'm next, my next uh, activity. Oh, I've also sewn in a truly obscene number of hooks and eyes down the front. On the front, not counting the ones on the collar, there are 40 hooks and 40 eyes, four zero. So that was absolutely exhausting. But they're on now. So what I'm gonna do now is put in boning, and that's gonna be in all of the seams. I'm also gonna put boning in these panels since they kind of want to uh, wrinkle up. But I'm also, going to be sewing a pretty much a solid wall of these black buttons down here so they're going to be the buttons are going to be touching each other pretty much that's just going to be like a solid line of buttons i that's just kind of the vision that i had for this i'm also going to be making a placket a silk placket to just put in here to you know because it gapes a little bit i was thinking that maybe i could have black ribbon trimming running down on either side and then have a placket over top in between those and so the buttons to that placket but that just seems like it would be too much so I'm hoping that if I have a silk placket under here and then I have a, just a solid wall of buttons sewn right here that will obscure any of the gaping enough so that's what I'm going to work on now and I'll check in after I've done the waist tape the boning and sewn on the buttons I'm you know you guys all know how to do those things. They're, they're very simple, so I'm not gonna make you watch me as I do them. Okay, so this is not the first fitting, but it is the first one that I am showing. I think that it's going remarkably well. It's got some creasing, some kind of wrinkling up right here, and that would help if I were to kind of unpick the collar and move this all up a little bit, but I really don't want to deal with the collar again so I think it's going to be fine and I'm hoping that the ribbon detail will just kind of hide or at least distract from that enough. Um, the buttons I think look great. It's this is this is not the most comfortable or convenient thing that I've ever made. In fact I'd go so far as to say it is the most uncomfortable and most inconvenient thing that I've ever made because it takes a long time to do up all of those accursed hooks and eyes. And it really forces me into this 
kind of, I hope you can see this, it forces me to this kind of position and I can't really move my neck. <laughs> but I'm not going to be wearing this for, you know, everyday stuff. It's, it's all silk. So I'm not going to just be wearing this to go to the grocery store or whatever. This is a more formal thing. It's not like a, a ball gown because it will have sleeves, but it's definitely for more formal events. Um, so it doesn't need to be incredibly comfortable. So I still have yet to, I've put in the waist stay. I think I can actually make that uh, a little bit tighter. I have yet to do the boning. And normally I like to um, kind of get this, the basic, the, 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 the body of whatever it is I'm working on done. And then I'll do the kind of go back and do the ornamentation and I'll do the waist tape and the boning and the, the buttons and the closures and all that kind of stuff. But this silk is really prone to catch. Like if I, if you listen, you hear it's just kind of catching on little bits of like dry skin on my fingers. So I really don't want to be tossing this around if I don't have to be. So I'm, I just haven't cut the sleeves yet because I figure if I were to cut the sleeves now and put them on, then they would just kind of be on there taking all of this abuse for when they don't have to be. So I wanted to essentially get the body of the bodice finished and then I will do the sleeves. And I'm also going to um, like decorate the sleeves, like the cuffs, before I sew them on to the bodice um, so that I'm not tossing the bodice around while I'm uh, ornamenting the sleeves. So actually the last step is going to be sewing the sleeves on. Um, but I'm going to, well actually right now I'm going to go to bed because it's that time. It's almost, oh my gosh, it's almost 10. Ugh. But tomorrow I will work on tightening the uh, waistband, or the waistband, the um, waist stay, and doing the boning. Oh, I also still need to make the placket. You can see there's, focus, oh wait, there we go. You can see there's a lot of corset cover showing through there. So that's what I'm gonna do. Bye-bye. I have decided to work on the collar now. In the 1890s, it was pretty common to have a, like a collar made out of ribbon in a contrasting color or matching color to the rest of the bodice. And then it would be finished with a bow in the back. This is, I have this on my uh, Basque bodice here. You can see the collar kind of wraps around and then this bow goes in the back. But with this collar, I just kind of gathered it into the right size and there isn't any sort of backing, it's just a piece of ribbon. So for this one, I wanna be a little bit more professional. So I'm gonna give it, I'm gonna cut out another piece of this white stuff and that's gonna be the kind of backing or lining for the collar. And then instead of gathering the collar just into place here and here, I'm going to uh, pleat it down. Um, and that's just going to go all the way around. So that's what I'm going to do. So, yeah. I cannot believe it, but the bodice is finally done, with the, except for the sleeves, obviously. I put boning in the front, in the darts, and at the front here. I tried putting it all around, but it just looked really weird and it sat very strangely with boning. So I took it all out. So the back and sides are not boned. Got a little bow, a big bow at the back. So now it is time to start working on the sleeves. I think the sleeves, the shoulders need to come up a little bit. The sleeves are gonna be sewn onto about there where this line is, but I'm gonna cut away a tiny bit of I'm going to, or maybe not cut it away, but I'm just going to make sure to sew the sleeves on up a little bit higher and then I can cut this away later. So I'm going to start working on the sleeves. They are not interlined. They're just regular lined. They're two pieces and I will show you what they look like when I've got all of the pieces cut out. And we have the sleeves cut out. You can't tell, but the linings have also been cut out and the silk has been placed on top of them, on top of the linings, that is. So I'm going to now baste the silk to the lining pieces and then overlock the edges because as I believe I probably mentioned before this silk is very very prone to 
prone to praying, prone to fraying. And it really does just want to completely shred apart. So I want to overlock the seams so that nothing bad happens, nothing untoward happens. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna baste everything together and or baste the um, silk to the lining and then I'm gonna overlock the seams. I'm going to learn the lesson from the body of the bodice and I'm going to do the basting stitches inside of the seam allowance so they're not out outside so I don't have to pick them out later because that was kind of a pain and they left some kind of ghosts, some stitching ghosts and I don't want that. So that's what I'm gonna do now. See you later. So, 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 here we are in the terrible, terrible lighting. I've gotten this, this part of the sleeve sewn up and I want to copy the cuff from this, I've shown it before, this antique 1895-ish bodice. This is not part of the bodice right here. This is a bag, don't worry. Um, although the bodice is in pretty rough shape, I've got to say, ooh, maybe I could do one of those antique clothing piece examination videos on this. Because I have the skirt too, and it's kind of rare to find the bodice and the skirt together. But anyway, I digress. I wanted to copy these cuffs. So I'm going to sew up the inner seam. These are, these are one-piece sleeves, but um, the cuffs will be fine, the same. So I'm going to sew up the inner seam, but leave it open by about an inch at the bottom. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to just turn the seam allowance over twice and just whip stitch it to the lining all the way up to just kind of close that part off. And then I'm going to pipe this pipe, this, this part of the cuff, this very cuff edge here. And then this is going to be done with black ribbon. All of the ribbon on this bodice is synthetic because I could not find... A, I could not find actual satin, silk satin ribbon that was wide enough for the neck band and for the bow on the back of the neck. And also, silk satin ribbon is very expensive, and I looked into buying a few yards of the smaller silk satin ribbon, and it came out to like 50-something dollars, and I don't want to spend 50-something dollars on ribbon. That's absolutely absurd. So, using synthetic ribbon. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to stitch up the whatever seam this is and then I'm going to whip stitch the raw edges down to the lining so that it looks all tidy if anybody should happen to see this part. I might, uh, I do have enough fabric left over to make a uh, facing like the one that's in here. It's difficult to see so I might end up doing that if I feel like it's necessary after I've constructed the whole thing, so we'll see. I decided to go with the rest of the seam. That's what the uh, antique bodice had, so I just decided to go with that. It seemed like it would offer more coverage. I didn't want this kind of flapping back and showing the uh, lining underneath. This one was turned right way out. So now I'm going to sew the piping onto here, cover up all of the stitching and all of the overlocking. This is the piping I'm going to use. It's exactly the same as the piping that I sewed on the hem, except I used a slightly smaller cord for this since I thought that the uh, cord that I used to make the hem piping was a little bit big and it would make kind of bulky piping for a, a wrist. That's not in focus. Come on, fo why are you focusing on the typewriter? That's not the point. Come on. Come on, I know you can do it. I know you have it in you. There we go. Look at that. Wasn't so hard. So I'm going to sew this on. I'm going to sew this on by hand because I feel as though, I don't feel as though, I know as though that the cuffs are too small to fit through the machine. So yeah, I'm just going to sew these on by hand and I will get back to you. So here we are. The sleeves have been piped very prettily, I think. I decided to go with a facing on the inside. It just made more sense. That's what the original has, too. Facing. Difficult to do this one-handed. But the inside of the original is faced. So now it's time to put on the uh, ribbons, the black ribbons. So there are these. They're about the same size as the ribbons on the original bodice. So I'm going to put those around the cuffs and 
On the original one, these are not stitched down at all. They're just kind of left there, and then they, I think they're tacked down underneath the rosette. Uh, that feels a little loosey-goosey to me, so I'm going to stitch mine down just a, a little bit. And then I'm not sure how to completely replicate this rosette, and I'm not frankly sure if it is a good idea to completely replicate this rosette because this is made out of silk ribbon, and my ribbon is synthetic because, like I said, I couldn't find any satin ribbon. And even if I could find it, I wouldn't have been able to afford it. And I feel like this would look kind of stupid in a synthetic ribbon. So I'm going to figure out some sort of rosette type thing to do with the ribbon that I have. I might just kind of do a little bow. So I'm going to do that. Bye. Behold us thou, mine cuffs are complete. And when they're in the light, you'll be able to see them. So this isn't actually like a bow or anything, I just took four little pieces of ribbon and cut them short and looped them up and sewed them on and then I took two more pieces of ribbon and cut them in the V shape and sewed them on and then I took a loop and sewed it on. So now it's finally time to put the sleeves onto the bodice and my patent pending method of sewing on 1890 sleeves is to sew the bottom part on first and then cut the threads and everything and uh, then gather up the top part and then sew it on and that I've never had a problem with that method so that's what I'm gonna do I cannot believe it I'm putting on the sleeves Whew. the sleeves are on and looking great if I do say so myself but we're not done yet we have a few more things to do first of all I need to put uh, one more button on here I was leaving room for a brooch, but when I tried it on, I actually decided I want the brooch to sit a little bit farther up. So I want to put another button on here. And in my original concept sketch for this, you can see that the sleeves are fuller, but I put in these ribbon epaulettes that were part of the pattern for the Basque bodice. But I think what I want to do instead is take inspiration from this daguerreotype. It's a daguerreotype from the 1890s, which you don't really see. I got it in Maine, and I call them my sassy ladies because I then I just get sassy energy from them, although I probably shouldn't assign character traits to them, not having known them. But if you look at this one here, see that little bit of something right there on her shoulder? I think that is some sort of implication that she has some sort of ribbon detail uh, back where her sleeves meet her blouse waist. So, I am going to try to mimic that and I'm going to do some sort of, have some sort of thing here. Oops, that, that's the wall. I'm going to have some sort of thing here like that. Oops, like that. So I'm going to figure out how to do that, how I'm going to experiment around with a few different ways of doing it, and I will get back to you when this is finished. I'm so excited. <laughs> Bye. Well now, the bodice has indeed been finished. I am looking at it right now. I've not worn it for very long because it's quite warm and it's been, you know, between 80 and 100 degrees here in Portland but you do not get to see it yet. Yes, I'm going to be incredibly cruel, but there is a uh, rhyme and a reason be behind my cruelty. You see, I'm currently working on another project which is going to pair very nicely with this bodice. It's not specifically designed to go with it, but they're going to go very well together. And I'm, of course, filming that one too. And I've also ordered a video camera. So I, my plan is, once I finish this other project, I'm going to film the big reveal of the bodice and this other thing together. Um, and it's going to be the first thing that I film on a video camera instead of on my uh, iPad or on my phone. So you'll just have to stick around to see the big reveal of the bodice or, and of my uh, new project. Or of course you could just go and see the pictures of the bodice that I put on Instagram. But I um, hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you stick around. Bye!